Welcome to this short podcast uh, video about peas and beans. My name is Pete Ionetta. I'm a researcher at the James Hutton Institute, specialises in sustainable food systems, particularly legume-based food systems. And I've got the pleasure of sitting here with uh, Steve Belcher, who's joining us from Peterborough, and he is uh, he works at PGRO. Uh, Steve, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi yeah. there, Steve Belcher from PGRO. Um, Principal Technical Officer, I've been here a lot of years and I'm principally involved with descriptive list variety evaluations of peas and beans and that's both pulse crops and uh, and vegetable crops as well. Okay, so you neglected to say exactly how many years you've been there, Steve, but you can keep that as your secret. Um, today, I'd like to you know talk about these four varieties that you've recommended we showcase in our field plots. Uh, that was two bean varieties, Lynx and Yukon, and also two pea varieties called Zero Four and Detona. So, starting with the beans, what could you tell us about these? Why have you recommended them? I've recommended Yukon because it's now one of the earliest maturing spring beans that we have. It is the earliest by some considerable distance. Um, hence the use in northern situations running up into Scotland as well. But of course, I've put links in there. It's not the earliest one. In fact, it's one of the latest maturing ones, but it is one of the more popular beans, the highest yielding bean, the bean with the best downy mildew rating. So you do need a comparison um, to compare against. Um, the two peas that I, I picked out were 04 and Daytona. 04 is a real oddity. It has been over the years. It's the earliest maturing pea there is by some considerable distance. In, in Scotland, you could be talking up to three weeks earlier than any other particular variety. But you do need to grow it at a higher plant population. Um, Limigran recommends somewhere in the region of 110 plants per square metre compared to the usual 70 to 80 plants. Of course, I put that alongside Daytona. As Daytona is one of the most popular um, blue-green varieties that are grown nowadays does hold its colour particularly well, and hence we've got a comparison then back to 04 and also in terms of yield. So I've heard that 04 is, is good for intercropping as well. It is a popular choice in intercrop. I get is that because it doesn't shade other plants or it stands more upright? It does tend to stand reasonably well. It's also a very short variety. So um you do have to be careful with 04 because if 04 lodges, it's then very difficult to pick up off the ground with a combine header um, because of its shortness. Um, as far as intercropping goes, I think it will have a use, particularly where your partner within the intercrop is an early maturing crop, and 04 can give you the advantage in that. Otherwise, for intercropping, you may be looking at slightly later varieties, for example, with oats and with wheat. They're later maturing, you may want to look at a later variety because of that. Okay, thanks, Steve. And you know, with respect to these, um, you know, the the, the um, earliness, that's a major issue, isn't it, for growers in in, uh, in Scotland? There are other uh, uh, approaches to dealing with earliness, and there's other varieties out there. For example, I know the winter bean honey has become popular too. Could you comment on that choice? Yeah, honey is a good choice for um, northern situations and running into Scotland. Again, it's one of the earliest winter beans that we have. It's short strawed, it's stiff strawed, and will, and will suit Scotland. Probably not the earliest one that we could ever have, but there's always this compromise between what you want in terms of yield and earliness and other characters as well. There's there's always this bit of a trade-off between what you want in terms of characters and, and maybe the final yield. Okay. And obviously, you know, Yukon's quite a new one, I believe, on the market. I, I, do you think a lot of Scottish girls will be aware of Yukon? Also, I understood that it was found almost by accident on a field walk. Could you tell us a little bit about yeah, Yukon and, and its history. How Yukon came about was that PGRO had a, had a committee with, with, of northern growers and uh, and some representatives from the trade uh, for northern situations, and we were told time and time again, we need earliness, whether it be in peas or beans. I happened to be walking through some of LS Plant Breeding's um, breeding trials, 
and there was one or two varieties in there that were extremely early compared to the rest. So I put it to them that they should look at these a little bit more. Initially, they weren't that interested, but we did some trials both with SRUC and with um, Frontier in the north. And out of that came two or three varieties, and we finally ended up with Yukon, which is now on the descriptive list. Mm. I wonder what we'd come across if we spent more time treading the boards out in the field. Uh, well, but... well the, the varieties were always there, but mm. the breeder of that particular variety has told me in the past, Steve, you can have earliness, but you'll trade that off against yield. So it just depends what you need. Okay. And you know, more recently, in terms of looking at the market, we've seen some more lucrative markets emerging for pulses, particularly for the developing uh, you know, food-based demand and, and plant-based products. And obviously, the highest quality pulses are required uh, for, for these markets. Now, while Scotland has very low brookhead issues, that insect that causes a hole in the beans. Chocolate spot can be more of an issue. Also, I believe post harvest drying regimes seem critical. Have you any pointers for growers in these two regards, the chocolate spot and post harvest drying? Chocolate spot can be a particular problem in Scotland um, because of the amount of vigorous growth that you tend to get up there. It's quite a rapidly developing disease. So once you start to see it in, in a region of about 5% of infection, then you need to put a, a protectant spray on. We have some good fungicide available to, to control the disease, but they are protectant and you need to get them on particularly early. Um, actually, the, the second timing is the more important timing um, and you can often put on up to three applications of that. So that's in terms of chocolate spot, but in terms of post harvest or indeed harvest and post harvest handling is then I would recommend that you get the beans as and when they are ready. Um, you'll often find that the pods and the beans mature some way ahead of the stems. And that can cause some issues at some times because you're waiting for the stems to mature. But what a, a lot of growers are finding now is that they can actually harvest some of those green stems. The combines will, will cope with them and take them when the beans are ready. You'll maintain the quality um, more so that way because often the beans can, can turn black if they're exposed to light. And that comes on to the post-harvest handling. Handle them gently, handle them as few times as possible because of seed coat cracking. But also in terms of drying, dry them slowly ambient air if possible, little heat if you need it, and use dehumidified air. Beans are large seeded. They offer very little resistance to airflow, so, so there's not a drying takes a long period of time to do. They're large seeded. You need to dry them slowly so they dry almost from the inside out. Otherwise, you end up with, with, a, with a, a, a center that can still remain quite damp. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Steve. Some some really good pointers there. Now, th I know that there are, of course, many varieties of of pea and bean and other other pulses. We know soybeans emerging and common bean and lupin even as well. But I, I you, to focus just on on pea and beans, they um, I see PGRO has moved away from recommended lists of a few varieties to descriptive lists with many many more. I, I certainly welcome that as a scientist. Um, can you say what motivated the shift and also have you seen an impact from that shift? Are you seeing an increase in the diversity of varieties that you see in the field? I think it's early days yet. We only moved to a descriptive list for the 2021 list. The reasoning behind it was to offer, as you said, diversity, allow growers to make their own choices, give them more of a choice of diversity. For example, we're talking about earliness and we often see a yield reduction because of earliness. But for some growers, earliness will outweigh the advantage and have a lower yield. So it's offering growers more choice. And yeah, it will increase the size of the list. It has increased the size of the list. But I think over time, the list will be self-maintaining and that we'll see varieties that are being grown, they'll be grown, and those that won't be grown just won't. We do have some restrictions within the list itself. It's not just going to grow forever, particularly in terms of, of um, 
seed production hectares. Mm -hmm. well, I, I certainly like to see these older varieties being maintained as a scientist. I, you know, they're, they're quite curious to me in lots of ways, not just because of obviously the food value, but because of the other values that they might offer in terms of integrated pest management or you know, health value. But when I look at, again, going back to pulse based markets, um, particularly the darker types like the old maple peas, the old timer cultivars like Maris bead, um, do they offer benefits in field too? Of course, Mary Speed has been on the recommended list or descriptive list since 1964, so it's kind of stood the test of time. But it is the only one of its type. It's the only one now that's not pale hilum, has a black hilum. It's also very small and very round and, and has a particular market in the pigeon trade. But one of the reasons it has stood the test of time is that it does appear to be more resilient to disease. And often where we've seen trials where, where we've had high levels of Chocolate spot, for example, we've seen Mary Speed top yielding in the trials when normally it's one of the lowest yielding. Yeah. Maple peas, on the other hand, that you call them old timers, but in fact, we've still got two maple peas on the descriptive list. We've got Rose and Mantara, both of which have grown quite successfully for, for their various markets. And indeed, one of the uh, markets that, that they do get used for is in sprouting peas. So, so they're grown under control conditions. They're sprouted to two to three inches tall and used in, in salad mixes. Mm -hmm. And I'm told the, the, the colour of the seed, which is often brown or flecked brown, often gives a peppery taste to that particular salad and offers a, a different choice. Great. Thank, thanks very much. So <laughs> finally, probably the last question for I could talk on all day quite easily, but overall I've heard um, the highest yields and most stable yields of pulses like peas and beans are more consistent from mixed farms, with that is farms which include animals in the system and that employ integrated practices. So why do you think that is? Well, I'm not sure that it's just peas and beans that uh, that have more stable uh, yields from from on mixed farms and using farmyard manures, I'm sure it, it runs across all crops as well, but they are the best crops that I tend to see where, where farmyard manure of various types has been, been used. Why? Not just down to the end, it's down to all the nutrients within the farmyard manure and it's down to the organic matter that's being ploughed back into the soil as well. Great. Well, Steve, this is a very short chat, obviously, for, for today's event. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you can find them online at pgro.org. I'd encourage you to become a member if you are not. There's a wealth of information there. Um, and not just that, you can have uh, you know, great chats with the staff. Steve is just one of a whole team of people, all with a vast range of expertise in crop impulses. So thanks very much, Steve, and uh, good luck with your field season. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, cheers.